Good evening, and welcome to another Bible study here at Hurricane Baptist Church as we continue our study into 1 Timothy. Uh, we've been working our way through here. It starts off in kind of giving Timothy the instructions on how to be a pastor and how he should act, and, and then he goes on and addresses the church. And we're over into chapter 4, and uh, we stopped, I believe, last time at verse number 12. So we're going to pick up, I'll read, read kind of back up to verse 12, and then we'll uh, go on from there. So 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, and verse 12, it says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity or love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So as he lays out this, we covered that quite extensively last time, so we won't go back through that. But he lays out all these areas of life. He says, uh, you're a young man, but uh, so you need to be an example. That people don't say, well, he's just a kid or he's just a young guy. But uh, you need to be an example in all these different areas to set, uh, show people that of your maturity and your willingness and your ability to lead. And so he, Paul's planning on coming to visit him now, because we see that in verse 13. In verse 13 he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So Paul says, in the meantime, I'm on the way. I'm going to come see you. But he says, in the meantime, he says, this is what you need to be doing. He talks about reading. And he's not talking about just uh, sitting at home or sitting, in a, sitting down reading. Uh, what he's saying about read it to people. Be reading the, the, the scripture out to people so they, they hear the word. Uh, we want to, it's, you know, in that day and time, especially in the synagogues, they would sit in the synagogues and read, and then they would interpret or they would uh, have a discussion about it. And he's saying here, he says, you need to be reading, he said, an exhortation. And so to, to exhort somebody, to encourage them, to lift them up, to edify, uh, and to, to really, uh, I want to say, motivate them, uh, charge them up where they, where they really want to get involved and do something. Uh, this is a, the walk of a Christian. That's what the, the pastor, through the preaching and teaching of the Word, uh, that's, that's one of the, the uh, objectives, if you would, of the, of the preaching and teaching of the Word, to get people excited. Uh, not to be excited where they're, they're getting out of control and uh, acting silly or anything, but get them excited about the Word of God and, and sharing the Word of God and what God is doing in their life. You know, we, we talk about ways to exhort people. Uh, one of the ways we can is to show what God is doing in our life. And if we have that enthusiasm and, and that drive and that des desire to please God, people can see that in us. And it might we can use that then maybe to encourage them to get them more involved in the Word of God. And then the last thing he says there in verse 13, he talks about to doctrine. He says, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And doctrine is the uh, teaching, uh, doctrine is uh, this teaching of the Word. Uh, what we stand for, what's your doctrine, what do you stand for? And that's what he talks about there. He says, you just, we read, we exhort, and, and then we train, we, we bring forth the doctrine. Okay, we explain the doctrine. What are the doctrines we believe in, like in the virgin birth? Uh, we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, the physical resurrection, and, and things like that. And he says, be, be teaching all that till, till I come. So in the meantime, we have a responsibility, and we have a responsibility on earth now, waiting until Christ comes, don't we? Until he returns to, to uh, set up his kingdom. So let's go a little bit further. Uh, well, I was going to go over to Hebrews 10.25 before I leave that. It talks about the church over in Hebrews 10.25. Let me turn over there real quick. Over in Hebrews 10.25. Let's go to verse 24. He said, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We live in a day and time now when this is uh, Christians aren't being very faithful uh, to these two commands here. He says uh, to provoke uh, one another to love and to good works, to, to encourage one another, to, to uh, help and incite a desire uh, to do the good works and to love one another. And then he goes ahead in verse 25. He says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And that's, that's just coming to church on Sunday. When the doors open, we need to be there to encourage one another, to be sharing fellowship, to learn. If it's a Bible study, if it's a preaching session, whatever's going on, he says we need to be there. Don't forsake that because that's where the strength of the church comes from. All these things he's talking about over here, we mentioned with, um, in First Timothy that Paul says, this is what I want you to be doing. That's what you would get today when you come to the church. We you know some of the words are the same words, like the exhortation, they exhort one another. Uh, and he says here, that's what, that's what we're to do. And so, you know, uh, people sometimes they think, well, you know, I can stay home. I watch TV and catch a, a lot of preaching on TV. A lot of uh, churches stream and, and a lot of uh, 
great preachers out there bring their message, but that's not the same as going to church. It's not the same as being part of the fellowship. When you get to the church house and you get to be with other believers and you can exhort one another, you can encourage one another, you pray for one another, and you come together to be unified when you hear the preaching and teaching the Word to help bring us together and understand what God wants us to do. So these, these kind of verses like over in uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 25, and 24, and 25, uh, we read through them and people, some people even memorize scriptures like this. But how, how do we react to it? You know, it's one thing to read the Bible. It's another thing to study the Bible. And it's still another thing to be obedient to the Bible. Uh, you can read the Bible, and a lot of people read uh, through in a year. And uh, so when you read it, read the Bible through in a year, and I've done that uh, according to a, a set schedule, but you end up just reading what it says and just trying to get through it so you don't miss out on the day. You really don't get to get a lot out of it unless you go back and, and study it more. So the idea is we can read it, then we can even study it and meditate on it and, and get an understanding of what he's trying to tell us to do or not to do. But then it comes time, then we have to apply that. And I believe that's where we fall short right here, in, especially in verse 25. The assembling of ourselves together, people, they know what it says, and they understand what it says, but it doesn't make a difference when it comes time to decide on Sunday morning or Saturday night whether I'm going to go to church tomorrow, get up Sunday morning, go to church. And so and it says here, as the manner of some is, people today, we get church attendance going down, down, down. You say, well, you're a preacher and you, you're, you're concerned more about that. But as a pastor, as a teacher, as a preacher, yes, I'm concerned about it because uh, people aren't being fed. Uh, new Christians, people get saved. And then they don't get discipled. They don't go to church. They don't see, and if they do go to church, they don't see the, the, the um, older in a spiritual sense, the older members, uh, they're worshiping in, in attendance. Uh, they see a sporadic attendance. They see people showing up now and then when they want to, and when they don't want to, they don't. So, again, it gets back to what we need to do. It says, this is what the matter of some people are, but he says, what you need to, you need to exhort. But he said, there's a day coming. And then what he's talking about there is the day that Christ is going to return. And uh, if he thought it was important back in that day, almost 2,000 years ago. Can you imagine what it would be like today, 2,000 years later? We're that much closer, aren't we? And so and we look at the times and we see what's going on around us, and we really get a feeling like, you know, and a lot of preachers are talking about it right now, and, and we talk about the rapture a lot. And uh, the people talk about the tribulation, and they talk about the, the millennial reign and all the things that's, that's coming. And so as we see that day approaching, we need to be more diligent, be sure that we're out there sharing the gospel and getting people to come to church to hear the gospel being preached, hear it being taught, see it being lived out. So we'll go back over now to uh, 1 Timothy. Let's now we'll go to verse 14. He says, I Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, uh, by the lead, presbytery of the leadership, and what he's basically saying is they recognized a, a gift of, of Timothy and they laid hands on him and kind of anointed him uh, to, to get into the work as a pastor, as a preacher. And he says, don't, don't neglect that gift. He said, a gift that's in the, uh, he says, don't be careless or, or don't treat it lightly. Uh, so many people, you know, when we get saved, we get saved, what we happen, right away we get a gift of the Spirit. The Spirit gives us a gift according to what He wants to do in us and through us in the, our walk as a Christian. And uh, some people have the gift of, of their preaching, have the gift of preaching, of teaching. Uh, we have, uh, I said, let's see, I have some other things. Uh, speakers, some, some people that aren't preachers or teachers, but are great speakers, great motivators with the Word of God. Uh, so uh, that's the gift that people have. And, and then we see the uh, musical side of it, that with the singers and uh, people that can play the piano and the guitar and all those kind of things. They have all these gifts that God gives them, and some of those are spiritual gifts and some of those are just talents that we have. But whatever the gift or the talent that we have, it's a gift from God. It's something that the Holy Spirit is working in us, and He wants us to use not only the gifts but our talents to His glory. And, uh, when we look at all these different things, it's not for not for me to stand up and say, hey, look at the gift I have. I can, I'm a great orator, which you know I'm not, and uh, or a great speaker or a great teacher. No, you don't look at those things and say, look at me. You say, look at God. God has brought me into the picture. He's given me this gift or this talent to bless you and to glorify Him. And so when we see these kind of things, we want to be sure that we don't neglect the gift of God. Be sure that we use our talents and our gifts in a way that people see us doing it in a way to bring glory to God. 
the, the whole purpose of all these things that we look at as we're reading this portion of Scripture is to point to God, to see, let people see God alive in our life. What a difference Jesus Christ makes. When you come to know Christ as your Savior, what a difference it makes. And so we then have all these abilities, we, but with all the abilities and the talents and all this, we have a great responsibility. Christ has already went to the cross. He shed his blood. He's paid the price for sin. And so we have the responsibility now to take that into the world. Take it to the world and show them. And that's what uh, Paul is telling Timothy here. He says, you know, this is your responsibility. Don't neglect doing that. You, you have this calling. You have this anointing to, to preach and teach the word. And so don't neglect doing it. Don't put off. And one of, the, one of the things that can happen and we have to be careful about is the fact that we can get so busy that we do neglect doing what we should be doing. Uh, preachers can get so busy that they don't have the time to do the preaching and teaching like they should. And so we see here is the it's, uh, the idea is don't treat it uh, careless. Don't be treat it lightly. It's a it's serious. In fact, you know this is one of those things as we look. It's kind of like life and death. And people, if they don't hear the gospel, faith comes by hearing. If they don't hear the gospel, how the, how's the Holy Spirit going to bring conviction? So there has to be some something happen here that they get to hear the gospel and then through the hearing of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, God draws them and gives them a desire to repent and put their faith and trust in Christ. And so we have that responsibility. And that's what he's telling the Timothy. He said, don't be sitting around waiting for me to show up. You be busy doing what you're supposed to be doing, getting this church going until I get there. So we see what he's talking about there. And then he says, uh, we go to verse 15. He says, I want you to, to meditate on these things. Well, the word meditate has the idea of, of really pondering, if you would, uh, sitting down and, and reading it and studying it and then trying to take it in to become, so it becomes a part of us. You know, when I think about meditation, I think of uh, the idea that I'm really focused on it, on something, on a portion of Scripture or, or something that God's trying to do in my life or something I'm not doing that I should be doing. And so when I read the Scripture and I meditate on it, what, what does this tell me? If I went back to Hebrews 10.25, we just talked about that. If I was to take that seriously and then sit down and read it and really try to take it apart and say, okay, now, God, what are you trying to tell me? Or what, what do I need to do? And you meditate on that. You weigh it out. You take each portion of that verse and, and other verses that we could go to. You take each portion and you, you stop and think about it. Uh, what does this mean in my life? Am I, am I actually being obedient to this verse? Uh, these aren't suggestions. He's not saying, I suggest now you don't forsake the assembling of yourself. He's saying, no, don't forsake the assembling of yourself. And so am I taking that serious? And that's, that's just one of the verses. We could go to a lot of verses where we have a tendency to, to read it, but when the time comes to apply it, we kind of fall short. So we, we see here what he's telling Paul. He says, don't, or Tom Timothy, don't neglect it. Neglect it. Meditate on these things. And he says, I give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. And, and what he's saying, profiting, it might be profitable in all things. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to meditate on these things we just talked about. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the reading, the ex exhortation, the doctrine. I'm going to meditate on that and understand what God wants me to do with that. And then when it gets down here, then don't neglect it. I'm going to be mindful. Listen, I want to be mindful of my responsibility to use my gift and my talent to the glory of God. He don't, we don't get a spiritual gift just to sit there and look at the spiritual gift and say, I have the gift of teaching or I have the gift of helps or I have the gift of prayer or faith or whatever that spiritual gift is. I have that gift, but if you're not using it, you're abusing it because you're not serving the Lord. He gives you that purpose. We, you know, I liken it to um, kind of like a puzzle. We take, we take the body of believers, and he talks about that of being the arm and the leg and those kind of things. And he says, I, I give you the gift to be an ear, and I give you the gift to be a foot, and I give you the gift to be a hand. And so the Holy Spirit takes a, a group of believers, and he gives them different gifts. And then what happens is he wants to bring them together to form a body, to form a local church. And within the local church, you'll have people with the different gifts, and we need to have them exercising their gifts. And sometimes we need to help them discover their gifts uh, by putting them in positions and, and giving them challenges to where they, if they have the gift, they'll be able to use it. And uh, some people are, are hesitant. They, they have a gift, but they really don't want to have that gift. Uh, a gift of prayer. Prayer is, we talk about a lot. Prayer is a gift. Uh, some people are, are prayer warriors, and we're all to pray. Some people have the gift of prayer warriors, and, they, and there's a gift of faith. 
if it, they just really believe God for what it said, what He says. So they have that extra gift to be using them in the body of Christ. So we see here He's talking about now. He says we're going to be profitable in all things. And He said then verse 16, He says, "Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine." So pay attention to yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save, shall both save thyself and them that hear thee. So the idea of saving there is not not salvation. He's writing, you know, he's writing to the to believers. So it's not about salvation. They're saved, but he's saying here to Tim, he's writing to Timothy with believers rather. He says here that uh, to save yourself, to to be saved, to to live the kind of life, to live the kind of uh, life that's going to bring glory to God. So, so you take heed to yourself and unto the doctrine, and you continue doing it. We're content, we're called to be a testimony, to be a witness that others can see Christ in us and understand or what they need to do. So we're going to wind it up there. That'll take care of chapter four and, and uh, a few minutes maybe, but we won't get into chapter five yet. And we get talking about uh, the various duties of a preacher as a pastor as he gets into chapter five. So what do we know? We know one thing for sure, don't we? That you got to be born again. You got to be born into the family of God. As we read all this scripture, uh, except for salvation, the scripture is written to Christians. And so when we see this, we need to understand our responsibility to live out the Bible. But to live it out, you got to be born again. And what does that mean? That means that you repent. You recognize that you're a sinner. You understand? You hear the gospel. The good news. The good news is you don't have to go to hell. Right? The wages of sin is death. Every man is born. Every woman is born with condemnation. We're all condemned in our sins. And I know about the age of accountability and all those kind of things. It's kind of give us a little side book, sidebar. But in general, we look at you're born in sin. You're condemned in your sin. You're on your way to hell. And you must do something about it if you don't want to end up there. And God looked down and he said, you know what? I don't want man to go to hell. I don't want man to be separated from me forever. I want man to be reconciled to me. And so what I must do, I must send an innocent person down there to die on that cross, shed his precious innocent blood for the guilty. And when people see that and believe that that shed blood is payment for their sin, they'll have eternal life. So what must you do? You must repent. You must turn from the world, turn to God. That's what repentance is. You turn to God and you put your faith and trust in, in that shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that's payment for your sins and that blood alone. Nothing you can add to that. He said on the cross, it is finished. The blood is shed. It's done. And that's what it was. There was no extra to be done, no good works, no communion, no baptism, none of those. Those are all things we do because we're saved. Not to get us saved, not to keep us saved. It was done. And when I put my faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, as payment for my sin, and that alone, I have eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and for this time. We pray you would be with each one of us as we walk this pathway of life. We pray that we would be a living testimony of your mercy and your grace. Lord, we pray that others would see Christ in us and have a desire to know the one that made such a difference in our lives. Lord, so those that don't know Christ, we pray that this would be the day they would recognize that they're condemned in their sin. According to the scriptures, the wages of sin is death. But they don't have to die for their sin. Someone has already died for them. Christ went to the cross and he died in our place so that we might have reconciliation, that we might have forgiveness of sin and be brought into your family. We thank you for what you're going to do in the hearts and lives of those that don't know Christ. For we pray in Jesus' name.